Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Uh, here at the workshop for the first time, you raise your hand. Okay, man. Anybody here? Anybody here has been... How many people in here that have been here before? Raise your hand. Okay, so we have some uh, some people are coming back. We always uh, like to find out who's in the audience just to know how old jokes we can tell. And I, I say we. This is uh, really the first time I've done the this part of the program um, completely by myself. I've been sharing it with the different people, and it's worked out this time. I'll be doing it by myself and. Um, the format for the meeting will really be fairly straightforward. I'm going to be speaking for about 40 minutes. Then we're going to break up into small groups. And the purpose of the small groups is give everybody a chance to discuss some of the issues that are going on in your own life around this and to hear other men talk about some of these same recovering issues. And I'm glad to see there's some people here that have come back because I'm going to have to ask some of, some of you to help facilitate some of the groups. Um, as we go along, I think the question always comes up, you know, I've heard people ask me, well, why do we talk about this? Why do we keep talking about it? And this subject really has been uh, on the schedule from the very first workshop. And it's, you know, Doc Crandall used to uh, always ask me to remember to mention to people that have to remember that under every skirt there's a slip certainly a potential slip, and we, we, those of us in the program for a few 24 hours know of a lot of people that end up relapsing over relationships, over uh, their sexual behavior, and it's really, I think it's really, ex- it's extremely important that we deal with these issues once we have found out how to stay sober, how to keep from drinking one day at a time. The other issues, the issues of living, the problems we we see in uh, day-to-day living become important to us. I'd like to, just to also help form a basis of who our group is, how many here feel like they received good sex education from their parents when they were growing up? We have two hands here, three, four, don't be bashful, we, we won't discriminate against you, three, we have three hands in a group probably of about 50 to 75 men. There, there are usually two or three people here that somehow slipped, slipped up and had some type of sex education. How many people here, when you were sharing with your peers in the locker room, were honest with your sharing about your sexual behavior? <laughs> now we know you're lying if you raise your hand. <laughs> How many people here had healthy role models for parents? Both. Okay, we have about a dozen hands in the room. That I'm glad that there were some people out there like that. How many people here are in a ongoing committed relationship at the present time? How many people uh, put your hands down? How many people would like to be in an ongoing healthy relationship? I didn't put healthy in there before. Okay. How many people here have been divorced? I've divorced more than one time. Okay. How many people ever had sober sex before they got to the program? Uh, sober sex. That means without drugs. <laughs> okay. There, there are some hands here. Cause those are all. Uh, uh, <laughs> the question from the audience was that uh, was that solo or with a partner? <laughs> And uh, I, I meant it as with a partner. But um, you know the we well, you know the uh, you know Masters and Johnsons and Kinsey have taken a lot of studies about sexual behavior, and uh, you know Kinsey showed that 99% of men masturbated and 1% lied. And, uh, but the the ratio with women is 15% lie. The uh, 
like to talk about really a couple of things about just sexuality and sexual behavior. And I have to say that most of what I've learned about relationships has been in these rooms and since, since I've been in recovery. I've uh, had some book knowledge and some educational knowledge about some of these issues, but really getting down to the nitty-gritty and learning from a gut level, most of that has been in these rooms, and I'm very grateful for the chance to be able to share here today and also uh, the sharing we have in our small group. Um, I think something is kind of, you know, a story I heard the other day is kind of typical of what we... Um, you know, what happens sometimes in our marriages and relationships. You know, the woman came home from seeing her gynecologist, and she was just so happy and smiling, and her hu grumpy husband said, well, what are you so happy about? And she said, well, the doctor today told me that I had the breast of a 21-year-old. And he looked there, and he said, what do you say about your 44-year-old ass? And he, she looked at him, and she said, well, your name didn't come up. <laughs> And uh, I think that's typical in relationships a lot of times. You know, she's talking here and we're talking here and we're not really communicating. And obviously this couple wasn't particularly interested in any positive communication anyway. Um, I'd like to talk about really, I'm going to break my talk up into a couple of things. First, I'm going to share a little bit about what the program says, what the program, what the big book, and what we can learn, and these are things that you can take back and can uh, share with other people. And I'm going to talk a little bit about my own personal recovery and relationships and a little bit about the tools and things that I'm using in my own relationship. You know, the, the writers of the big book had a uh, very good sense of humor. Uh, I'll, I'm sure since people have heard my talk before, I won't ask for hands, but, you know, sex is discussed on page 69 in the big book. And, uh, gosh, this is a slow group. Um, explain to it, please. Uh, and this is uh, on page six. You have to be careful about quoting things in in groups, though. You know, uh, one of uh, always one of my friends told a uh, young lady to look uh, look up on page ninety six what the big book says. On page 96, this, this young lady went home and read this to find out how she's supposed to deal with her, this difficult sexual relationship. And on page 96 it says, Do not be discouraged if your prospect does not respond at once. Search out another alcoholic and try again. <laughs> you, are, you are sure to find someone desperate enough to accept with eagerness what you offer. To spend too much time on any one situation is to deny, deny some other alcoholic an opportunity to live and be happy. Let him know you're available. He may be broken homeless. If he is, you might try to help him about getting a job of giving him a little financial assistance. Perhaps you will want to take the man to your home for a few days. Be sure, but be sure to use discretion. You may be aiding in his destruction rather than his recovery. And uh, on page 69... And, uh, you know, we always quit reading how it works a little bit early. Uh, sex is actually mentioned 20 times in Chapter 5 after we quit reading. You know, for those of you who haven't read much of the big book, you can start after how it works and start from there. Specifically, it's mentioned in Steps 4 and 5. And on page 69, it talks about about sex. Actually, we, we fudge a little bit like in everything. It starts actually on the bottom of page 68. But on page 69 it says, we do not want to be the arbitrator of anyone's sex conduct. Conduct. We all have sex problems. We'd hardly be human if we didn't. What can we do about them? And it talks about being honest and about uh, taking the fourth step on this. And this way we try to shape a sane and sound ideal of our future sex life. We ask God to mold our ideals and help us to live up to them. Whatever our ideal turns out to be, we must be willing to grow toward it. We treat sex as we would any other problem. And, you know, this, I've heard a lot of, you know, we always, I talk about, you know, we all have our goals or our ideals about how we would like to behave, not only in sexual behavior, but in all areas of our life. And we all didn't have our behavior. And it's really the difference between our behavior and our ideals that gives us, gives us 
our discomfort. You know, this is where we get our guilt, our anxiety, our frustration. And the further we are away from our ideal, uh, our behavior is, the more uncomfortable we are. Now, I've heard people say, you know, they'd really, they'd just like to, you know, lower their ideals down, I mean, all the way down. And some of you may do that. And part, part of that is what we do here. Part of it is we talk about what is, what kind of behavior is responsible behavior. We talk about, you know, very few of us were given permission to masturbate when we were growing up. Very few people would say, well, that's okay. Everybody does it. And that's something you can accept and not feel guilty about. But at the same time, part of our ideals is to decide, you know, are we going to be responsible, honest human beings? And this is, uh, you know, part of, um, you know, that's really the, I think, the most powerful thing we have going for telling us how to work our relationships are really the steps and the traditions. It's really possible to practice the principles of the steps in your relationship. It's possible to practice the principles of the tradition in your relationship. And specifically, you know, I really a whole uh, 45-minute talk I sometimes give is just on practicing the traditions in your relationship. And it's possible if you look at the principles of the tradition and see how they can apply to your relationship. And certainly, you know, the first principle of the first step we, we know is honesty. If you're not practicing honesty in your relationship, then you, I wouldn't be surprised if you're uncomfortable with what's going on and if you have trouble communicating with the person in your life. The, one of the big issues that I always here comes up, you know, how long is it going to take my wife or my girlfriend to trust me? How long is it going to take her to trust my recovery? How long is, you know, how long is I'm, am I going to put up with this distrust? Usually, you know, my answer to that usually is, well, when you have been trustworthy long enough for her to forget your behavior. Most of our behavior, a lot of our behavior, we were in blackouts, so we don't even remember our behavior. But don't, I bet you your wife remembers your behavior or your girlfriend or, you know, they were sober. And, uh, they have to always ask you, you know, well, and a lot of us treat our alcohol and drugs as if it's, as if it's a mistress for us anyway. And it has been a mistress. It's been a very seductive, ongoing love affair with our drugs and alcohol and our significant other person has been um, been the one left out, has been the one that has not been part of this relationship. But, you know, I'd ask you how long would it take you to trust your wife after she had an affair with somebody? Two weeks? Two months? You know, two years? You know, I mean, that's the depth of the distrust that a lot of our wives have toward our disease. And uh, it's a depth of distrust because a lot of us were unfaithful when we were drinking and using drugs. And that's just part of the picture. It's not just the dishonesty about the drinking. It's also the dishonesty about the affairs. It's the dishonesty about saying we're going to be somewhere or be home for a birthday party and then not being there or coming home drunk, you know, or saying, well, I won't drink so much tonight. And over and over this for years and years, and then we expect we pick up our 30-day chip, and uh, we should be trusted. We should be trusted, and it, it, it doesn't work that way. I mean, some you know, it, it especially doesn't work that way the second time around. Time you relapse once doesn't work that way very often. So I think for me, you know, it's practicing these principles. You know, the in our steps, we talk about practicing these principles in all our affairs, and the hardest place it is usually to practice the principles of the program are at our home or in our relationship. One, of the, one night I was sitting down here at the fire, uh, must be about 10 years ago now, talking to a man that was having a lot of problems with his marriage and his wife was giving him the cold shoulder literally and figuratively and uh, but he also was a traveling man and whenever he's out on the road he found it necessary to find the young woman that he could sleep with and I finally you know I'd heard this you know off and on for about a year I'd talked to him and I finally looked at him and I said well when are you going to start acting like a married man you know if you want to be happily married I suggest you act like a married man you know, and the problem for many of us is, well, how does a married man act? 
Clearly. I mean, you know, we, most of us haven't had role models, or certainly not good role models. And I think that's the things we can learn in these pro- rooms. That's the thing you can come and say, well, now, you know, how does this sound to you? Does this sound right? And uh, he came back a few years later and told me he'd been acting like a married man and his relationship with his wife at 180 degrees. Now she was wanting to be sexual with him and she was wanting to enjoy him and be with him. Or before... Not, and, and it's based purely on his attitude and his behavior. And I can't guarantee that your wife or girlfriend or whatever will turn around because you begin to act in a responsible way. But I guarantee if you're acting irresponsible, that's the way, that's the kind of, you're not going to get much respect or trust. One of the things to look at as far as the program too is, you know, we say over and over in the, good, in the program that you, if you want what we have, then this is what we did. If you have a sponsor that you're using for some of your relationship problems, and you're not, and you're still having problems, you might look at, look at what kind of relationship does your, relationship does your sponsor have. I'm not saying to change sponsors, but I am suggesting that if you your sponsor is not in a good, positive, ongoing relationship, then maybe you need to find somebody else that can be your relationship sponsor. Maybe you can find. You know, find somebody that uh, has a good, stable marriage, and you can ask them, well, how are you doing it? What did you do? How is it working in your life? And so I think that it's important to look at where where you're getting your advice in the program. For me, it was important to uh, get uh, see a marriage counselor, and I think one of the contracts I have with my wife is we never make the last appointment for a marriage counselor. Um, right now, we're kind of on a four-month schedule. We've been down as close to twice a week. But uh, we never make the last appointment because that implies that we're always working on the relationship. That if they, we have a recovering relationship, that it's not fixed, it's not set, that we always have some things to work with. Because for me to say that I, if I, that I can have a rational decision about an emotional issue with my wife is a contradiction in terms. If it's an emotional issue, and we're both emotionally involved, and we both become irrational at times, especially if it's a real uh, something that's really strong. And uh, so it's really helped us to be able to sit down with a third person. And the third person shouldn't be your sponsor. It shouldn't be her sponsor. It needs to be a neutral person. It may be a minister. It may be a, it could be a therapist, a, a marriage counselor. Uh, needs to be somebody that feels neutral that can uh, help you communicate with your person. Talking about communications, I uh, have to ask you to think about what do you, what kind of words do you use to describe the uh, person in your life? And I over and over again use the word wife. Uh, if you're homosexual and you have a homosexual relationship, that's fine. But just, just substitute whatever word you use uh, for your significant other person. In my life, it happens to be a woman and wife at this time. But think about what kind of words have you used to describe your significant other person in your life? You know, is she your old lady? Is she your battle axe? Do you call her by her body parts? You know, is she a your pussy? You know, what you a bitch? What kind of words do you use? Not, I'm not talking about to her face now. I mean, I'm not. I'm hoping, hoping that, uh, at least when you were sober. I'm talking about when you're you're uh, down at the meeting and say, well, I've got to go home. You know, uh, my old lady's going to be upset if I'm late. You know, what kind of words when you you know you kind of putting putting your, when you're putting down your wife with the, with the guys trying to look macho? You know, what kind of words are you using? I suggest that those words have a lot to do with how you treat her. Have a lot to do with how she treats you. If you want her to be your bride, then call her your bride. Call your girlfriend. Think of something, the way, you know, your princess, whatever, you know, what kind of woman do you want at your home when you go home from this workshop? You know, you want, you know, what, you want some, you know, just think to yourself and, and start to call her by, you know, and not necessarily to her face again, but just say, well, you know, I'm going home to my bride. And then I could ask whether you've been married one week or 50 years. But, if you think about it and use those words, you'll begin to treat her that way. If you treat her that way, it's very likely that she will respond to that. 
And words are very powerful. And that's why, you know, we come in this program, we start to share honestly uh, around groups. You know, it's very powerful. You know, earlier tonight in our cabin meeting, I had a man say, I'm scared about being here. What a powerful statement for a man to say among men. And that is a true statement of a strong man to be able to say that. I'm scared. I'm, I'm uncomfortable being here. And it's those words that heal us. It's those words that make us stronger. Noel said once here, I think, you know, something that I always remember, you know, somebody asked him one time, well, how do we know when we're healed? How do we know when all this shit from the past is finally in the past? How do we know, you know, we do all these, we do these four steps, and we do these fifth steps, we get up and talk. But we know we're healed when we can reveal ourselves without shame. And you can get up and reveal yourself, warts and all, without shame. And you know you're healed, because I, I know I'm healed on a lot of my subjects, just from getting up in these rooms and revealing myself. And when I first started, it felt uncomfortable, a little shameful, you know, a little bit, you know, I, I was told I needed to do that. I don't have any shame about that man, so I know that part of me is healed. And that's the miracle of this program, is the fact that we can take parts of our life that we think are so shameful and so hurtful and uh, be able to uh, be healed with that. Another powerful statement I heard tonight in our cabin room, somebody said, uh, and, and, this is, it talk, and this is about sharing our pain, and I think, you know, we talk, you know, I've had a lot of education and a lot of training, but until I got to this program, I never learned about the pain of living, the pain of living that we've all experienced here. And for so long, I tried to use drugs and alcohol to get rid of that pain, and it didn't work. I heard what someone say tonight. It was so important for us to be a good steward of the pain I had been through. A good steward of the pain I had been through. And I see that as part of what we do when we share our pain, when we share our experiences, and most importantly as we share our growth. We share, well, how did we get from this place where we were crying and hurtful and alone and felt like we were terminally unique and no one had ever experienced these shameful things to the place where we can stand up and express ourselves and share and realize that I'm just another human being. You know, I'm another human being. And I, I heard of, I heard how it worked a thousand times before I heard it the, the fifth step the first time. And that's when it when it said in that in the fifth step, we share with another human being. And this implies that that's who I am. I'm another human being. And that has made me feel comfortable about myself about what's going on in my life. Just real briefly, share a little bit of my personal experience. Um, I was born into a family of uh, where my father was an alcoholic. I was the oldest of four children. My mother was uh, 15 years old when I was born. My father was 25, and uh, he was a practicing alcoholic. I understand he was drunk on the night I was born. In fact, the doctor was drunk when I was born. But New Year's Eve, they were all celebrating. And at um, just to jump to take some highlights of that, and I think when I was 15 or 16 years old, I was seduced by a minister of music, and I went through a lot of shame and guilt about the question whether I was homosexual or whether I was uh, what you know what was that? What did this mean? And it was. Really, only after sharing here at some of these meetings about that, that I get to the place where I was comfortable with that. That I get, you know, even though I'd seen a lot of psychiatrists and a lot of other things and talked about, it, was when I was able to talk about with other men and feel comfortable with that, that the shame has gone away. Um, as it turns out, I'm not homosexual. I really, you know, except for that one short relationship, uh, you know, I have not been with a man. As you know, Masters and Johnson, or, or rather Kinsey, quotes the statistic is anywhere from 35 to 50 percent of men have some type of homosexual relationship sometime in their life. And the I ended up, though partly, I, I'm looking back on it, partly just to prove that I was okay. I, I think, you know, I, I started, uh, you know, I think I ended up running towards the woman that I ended up marrying. It turned out she was an alcoholic and drug addict herself, and I thought she was just crazy. Um, 
I still think she's crazy. <laughs> she isn't still an alcoholic and drug addict. But, um, and ended up really after about seven years going through a, a situation where I wanted to divorce her and um, didn't because I didn't want to leave the kids we had at that time and ended up uh, really getting into my addictions at that time. Ended up divorcing this lady and uh, married a nurse for a few years because I needed somebody to take care of me and uh, then divorced that lady after bouncing back and forth between my alcohol and drugs. My present, my 15-year-old son confronted me with my present wife back in 1979. And when I saw in his eyes how he felt about my drinking and he was describing how I was acting in blackout, uh, I made a commitment to go into treatment and ended up going into a treatment program, relapsing after six months, but then staying sober. My sobriety date, September the 3rd, 1980. And it was with the beginning of recovery that I began to develop a relationship with my present wife. And uh, it took marriage counseling. It took us to go into a lot of meetings. Uh, but two or three things that meant more than anything else. And one is, you know, I was, when, I told, when I came into the program, I was told to pray. I'd pray in the morning and pray at night. But I was a closet prayer. You know, I didn't want my wife to see me. I'd pray when she was in the bathroom or out of room and I guess I've been sober about two years when uh, she came back unexpectedly and caught me, you know, caught me praying on my knees, you know, it's come out secrets and uh, how sick we are. And uh, anyway, she came over and got beside me. She wanted to know what I was doing. I told her and she said, but she'd always wanted to be married to someone she could pray with. I didn't know that. You know, we weren't talking about any important issues, but we started, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we started praying. Uh, that day, and since that time, we pray in the morning and pray at night. And um, that has, has to be one of the most strongest things that have happened to us. As far you know, and even tonight, when I get ready to go to bed, I'll say my prayers, and I will feel close to Judith and be close to her. So this is something we have shared, and it's, uh, the prayers we have are uh, semi-formal. We in the morning we pray uh, the serenity prayer, but put today after it. You know, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change today, the courage to change the things I can today, and the wisdom to know the difference today, and I will be done today, not mine. Uh, and, and then we add some personal things in there at night. We say the prayer of St. Francis, and we say the other short prayer I read in one of the books, and that is, God, thank you for all the things you've given us today. Thank you, God, for all the things you've taken away today. Thank you, God, for all the things you've left us today, and we do have so much to be grateful for. And for those minutes, and there have been times when we weren't speaking to each other when we got in the bed, but we would pray together. And, there were, and I think that has been a bond and has been something that has uh, really strengthened our relationship uh, beyond uh, beyond estimation. Uh, we read meditations and books together in the morning. You know, I'm very compulsive. We have, I have three books I read at night, and we have uh, two we read in the morning. We read the ones in the morning together. I mentioned before about never making our last appointment with a marriage counselor. And more than anything else, um, I've learned to accept her. And uh, we talk about, you know, acceptance, and for those of you that are not me with page 449, Paul O talks about acceptance being the answer to all the problems, but on the next page he also talks about accepting his wife, and he states on page 451, the courage to change in the serenity prayer meant not that I should change my marriage, but, whether I, but rather that I should change myself and learn to accept my spouse as she was. We have to remember that acceptance does not mean approval. You know, acceptance does not mean approval. Acceptance just means we accept things as they are. We accepted the fact we were alcoholic. That means we didn't like it. But that's what we are. And accepting my wife doesn't mean I have to like the way she is. It doesn't mean I have to like everything about her. It just means I have to accept her as she is and quit trying to change her. It's not my job to correct her or show her how she's supposed to do and I, my wife, you know, 
I don't think there's a few people in here that know my wife, but, you know, she, when she's bitchy, she can be really bitchy. And I used to say, you know, she'd be up in her bitch tree th- throwing things at me. And uh, I usually deserved it. See, that was the problem, especially when you, in early sobriety, when you first come in, you have a lot of things to be guilty about. You know, it's not hard to feel guilty. You know, for your wife to find something that you're uh, that you should have done or didn't do or wished you had done. Somewhere about five or six years ago, she got bitchy, and I accepted her where she was. I just, you know, I didn't run off to a meeting. I didn't uh, go out to the garage. I didn't start, I didn't take go into pitch battle with her and get defensive and start calling her names. I just kind of did with her like I've learned to do in these meetings with other alcoholics. You know, just kind of listen. And she kind of, after a while, she kind of got through with her thing and she went and did, you know, and the, the evening went ahead and we said our prayers and the next day, a miracle happened. She came up to me and she says, I'm sorry, I was bitchy yesterday. And that was a miracle for us. So that, you know, I, we, I just kind of thought that, you know, I didn't, I, 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 that, wasn't, that wasn't what I expected, but it's happened at least a dozen times since then. It happened just this last week. And, uh, it makes it easier to accept, by the way, once it happens, you know, it's kind of like, well, gosh, you know, maybe, that's, that's, maybe I can accept it a little bit better. But, and I learned something very important, and that was that just by me accepting her, and part of her problem was when she was feeling bitchy, whatever the reason, she was feeling unloved, unlovable. Whenever I got into this mode of either being combative or running away, it just reinforced in her that she was unlovable, so it made her feel worse. And the worse she got, the more... You know, the more she picked until, you know, she, it was easier for her to stay bitchy at me than it was to get in touch with some of her own feelings. So it's really helped. One of the things that, you know, about that same time I'd read a, in a book talks about how a lot of times we, the wives of alcoholics are kind of, you know, show one emotion instead of the other. And a lot of times when our wives are acting bitchy, they really just hurt. You know, they just really hurt. And they really need our love more then. Than any other time, they need a hug. Sometimes it's hard to hu- hug. You know, we used to, we used to give a lot, each other a lot of cards that had um, porcupines on them. I mean, that's about the way our relationship was the uh, first few, two or three years of our marriage. You know, you know the story about how how porcupines make love. You know, very carefully. And uh, but it's this practicing the principles and doing. You know what what needed to be done. And I'm not saying that my life and my relationship is that without any discomfort or pain now, but I'm saying that when I first came into the program that we might have two or three days a year that things went completely well without any problems, and now it's more like maybe two or three days a year that we really have some times when we really don't, don't do well. And the bottom line is now when things don't go well, I know it's one, I know Two or three things. I know one, this too shall pass. I know three, that I love her and she loves me. And just because she's bitchy doesn't mean she doesn't love me either. See, that was a hook that I got hooked into. When she was bitchy, you know, my mind would start saying, well, how could she treat me this way if she really loved me? How could she be this way? You know, and all that did was build a wall between us. And it's that wall that separates us so much from the person we love, you know, and all of you felt that wall where things would be going along just fine, and all of a sudden it's still like a brick hits your chest as she says something out of, out of, the, out of the blue, you know, it doesn't make sense, you don't even know what, where, you know, kind of like getting hit by a car that you didn't see coming, and then, then all of a sudden it's that feeling like, well, I need to run away, and I, I, I don't belong here, I'm hurting, you know, what's going on, what's this crazy woman talking about, and it brings up a lot of fear and anxiety from the past as far as what's going on. Couple of one couple of things I heard tonight I want to repeat again. And one is um about being sick is our secret. And the other uh somebody mentioned drop the rock and I don't know if y'all have heard the story about the rock or not, but <laughs> This man was out on a long hiking trip, and he found this beautiful rock that looked 
you know, really had a lot of crystals in it. It looked like it would be very valuable. So he put it in his backpack and was carrying it back to, back to, to, his, camp, to his campsite, which he had to ford a river to get to the campsite. And crossing the river, he slipped and got washed out into the deep part of the, uh, of the river. And uh, his friends that were with him were trying to help him. And uh, he was uh, trying to swim, but the rock was, you know, the big heavy rock was in his knapsack. And uh, they they yelled at him, and they said, say, come on, come on. And he says, well, I can't make it. And he said, well, drop the rock. You know, drop the rock. Drop the rock. And he says, but it's my rock. Mm-hmm. You know, that's what we do in the program so much. You know, we don't get lit rid of our shit. We don't get rid of our problems. We don't get honest. You know, we're because it's ours, we think it's so valuable that we're ready to give up our lives, our relationships. And it is really important. I see the dropping of the rock as our fourth and fifth steps, our seventh through ninth step. I want to read one other thing here from um, on page 452, still in Paul O's story. And uh, by the way, one of the things that helped me with my relationship was my sponsor asked me to read page 449 every night for three months when I was talk- kept talking to him about all my woe is me with my relationships. And I think that helped a lot. Eventually, I had to redo each of the 12 steps, specifically with Max, his wife, and mine. From the first saying, I am powerless over alcohol and my home life is unmanageable, to the twelfth in which I tried to think of her as a sick Alanon and treat her with love as I would give a sick AA newcomer. When I do this, we get along fine. Perhaps the best thing of all for me is to remember that my serenity is inversely proportional to my expectations. The, the higher my expectations of my wife and other people are, the lower is my serenity. I can watch my serenity level rise when I discard my expectations. Acceptance is the key to my relationship with God today. I never just sit and do nothing while waiting for him to tell me what to do. Rather, I do whatever is in front of me to be done, and I leave the results up to him, however it turns out. That's God's will for me. That's the end of my talk now. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.